Let's open our Bibles this morning to the Old Testament book of Job, chapter 15. Job 15 through 21, Job's torment. We're going to see what it's like to go through suffering. Some people don't like the book of Job because it's about suffering. Well, we all would like to see uh, happy days and party time, but life is filled with suffering and we need to learn how to go through it. The book of Job is going to teach us how to go through suffering. The book of Job is not going to teach us why we suffer. No book in the Bible will give a complete answer about that. Only in heaven will we know if we even bother to ask once we get there. But the most important thing is going to be how to go through suffering. And we see in chapter 1 of Job that Job has done nothing wrong. He's a good man. Look at verse 1 of chapter 1. He is blameless. He's upright. One who fears God and he shuns evil. And he offers sacrifices for his children just in case they have committed sins. He cares that much about their righteousness and acceptance with God. The whole scene changes for him when it changes in heaven. I don't think anything happens on earth but what it has already happened in heaven. In chapter 1, verse 6, there is a day when the sons of God, those are the angels, the good angels, the bad angels we call demonic spirits, they all come to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan, the chief of the bad angels, came among them. And the Lord opened up a challenge to Satan, started this whole thing off, and said, from where do you come? And Satan answered, from going to and fro on the earth, walking back and forth on it. The Lord said to Satan, have you considered, have you really looked closely and set your heart to analyze my servant Job? There is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. That's what God says about Job. He fears me, he loves me. So what does Satan say? Verse 9, does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him? In other words, you're protecting him around his household and everything that he has, blessing the works of his hands, his possessions. So in other words, uh, he's not giving you a hard time because you're blessing him. But now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. That is the essence of what's going on here. Will Job curse God? No matter how bad his circumstances are, will he... The word curse there from the Hebrew means to bless in an evil sense, to really put a negative curse on, to a negative blessing on God and to turn from God. So that's the challenge. You're blessing him. Put your hand on him and touch all that he has and he'll curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, behold, all that he has is in your power, only do not lay a hand on his person. So do whatever you want to prove your point and I'll prove to my point that he will not curse me. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Beginning in verse 13, the oxen, the animals are taken, the servants are killed, his own children are killed. He is totally wiped out financially, emotionally. All he has left is his wife. What does he do in verse 20? He tears his robe to show grief, shaves his head, falls to the ground, and worships. He worships God. Can you imagine that? He says in verse 21, Naked I came from my mother's womb. Naked shall I return there. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. Many people have used that quote. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Whenever we're angry at God because he took a loved one from us, a pet, a job, whatever it might be. We need to remember God gave it. And God can take it away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Chapter 2, the whole scene starts all over again. All the sons of God come to present themselves. 
The Lord says to Satan again, from where have you come? In verse 3, have you considered my servant Job? There's none like him on the earth. And so now Satan begins to raise the ante, so to speak. It's kind of like a card game. Skin for skin. Yes, all that a man has, he will give for his life. Skin for skin is an expression meaning say that Job was willing to give the skin of his kids to save his own skin. Let them die. But you touch his skin, he'll curse you. So, verse 5, stretch out your hand and touch his bone and his flesh. He will surely curse you to your face. So possessions are one thing, family is another, but your own body, oh, when his body is touched, he's going to curse you. So the Lord said, behold, he is in your hand, but spare his life. So notice that God's willing to get into this exchange, into this challenge to prove that Job is faithful and will not curse God. He puts hedges around Satan's access to Job, even as he does ours. Satan cannot come against us in any way beyond that hedge that God has set up. So we see the submission of Satan. He's a created being. He's not opposite God. He can only do to us what God will allow. And we have to trust, as we see in the book of Job, that God has a good purpose for allowing it. We know from the Apostle Paul, who wrote many years later, and by the way, Job lives around the time of Abraham, about 4,000 years ago. We know now from Paul's exp explanations in Romans that uh, adversity will teach us patience, which will teach us faith and hope in God, develop us, develop Christian character. Suffering will bring us more into the likeness of Christ. We don't, he didn't know all that. He didn't even know about this dialogue going on in heaven. All he knows is that one day he lost his kids and everything that he had, and the next day he lost his health, and he was in bad shape. These boils that he had uh, are explained throughout the book of Job, and they're absolutely horrible. He's in pain, he's in agony, he's got a bad skin condition, and um, then, to make matters worse, three friends come to console him. I say to make things worse because by the time they begin to open their mouths, they cause him much more grief, perhaps even than his physical ailments. They say nothing for seven days. They're so shocked at his condition, can hardly recognize him, but they're quiet, and that's good. So Job then begins in chapter 3 to open up, and he deplores his birth. He, he wishes he had never been born. He wishes if he had been born that he died at birth. If he had lived through birth that he would die today. And how many of us have not felt that at times? I wish I were dead beyond this earthly pale and into the presence of the Lord. Well, his friends have had enough of his complaining about his condition, and they begin to now give the worst counsel that anybody ever has given. The first one is the oldest. They worked by seniority, by age. Chapter 4, Eliphaz opens up with the comment, Job, the reason you are sick and have lost everything that you have is because you have sinned. They have a very simple understanding that if you are healthy and wealthy and wise, you're blessed and God loves you. And if you're not those things and you're suffering in some way, you sin. It's your fault because God only will do good and you're not receiving good, so you must be bad. And that is absolutely wrong. We know that Job is upright and this is simply a contest between Satan and God. So, in chapter 5, Job is explaining that uh, he's being chastened by God, he's unhappy with God, he's unhappy with his condition, he's unhappy with his friends. Chapter 6, uh, he says, I've done nothing wrong, and this is unjust. I should not have to suffer this way. So he also has that same understanding that if something is wrong with me, then I'm being punished, and I've done nothing wrong, so this is unjust. Uh, chapter 7, he says his suffering is, uh, is comfortless and the friends aren't helping. Now another friend in verse uh, chapter 8 comes in, Bildad. Again, the same theme as the first friend said. Job has sinned. Job, repent, and everything's going to be just fine for you. 
And Job says, that's not the case. I want a mediator, chapter 9, somebody who can take me to court and I can tell God that what he's doing is wrong. He doesn't want to go into the presence of God to worship him now. He wants to go and say, what is happening to me is unjust. Chapter 10, Job wants to plead with God, plead his case and say, this is unjust. What's happening to me? Now the third friend comes in in verse, uh, chapter 11, verse 1, Zophar. Guess what Zophar says? Same thing as the first two, Eliphaz and Bildad. Job, you've sinned, repent. And gets nowhere at all. And chapter 12, he begins to answer them and says, you guys know nothing about what you're talking about. He goes on through chapter 14 to defend himself. And incidentally, uh, that ends the first round of talks. Each of the friends uh, speaks, Job answers them. That's round one. Today we're going to cover round two. And we're going to find out that just like that little hamster that I had in the cage when I was a kid, running around on that wheel. Did you ever have a hamster? He was running around on that wheel. These guys are doing the same thing. Guess where he got? Nowhere. Just like you and I do when we start to complain around and around and talk and talk and get nowhere. Job has five themes that he talks about in round one, round two, and yes, dear friends, there's going to be a round three. <laughs> do come the last week and we'll see how it all turns out. But first of all, he's disappointed in his friends. And you can't blame them. They haven't come to help them. They've come to criticize them. And when you and I are counseling people, we should not make it a time of being critical. We should not tear down, but build up. Might not agree with somebody, but we need to build them up. Point number two, Job, like the friends, declares the greatness of God. More about the omnipotence and greatness of God here than any place else except maybe Psalms. But in Psalms, the greatness of God is couched with praise and worship and adoration and trust. Here, it's used as a battle axe, a sword. The friends say, God is all powerful and good and right and would not do this to you, so therefore you're a sinner. That's how they use the sovereignty of God. He then says, God is all sovereign and he could have prevented this and I've done nothing wrong, and so I'm angry at God for allowing this. Both are declaring the sovereignty of God, but in the wrong way. Point number uh, three, Job is disillusioned with God's ways. Been there? We all have. I'm disappointed, God. If I were you, I would have my life structured a different way. I'm disillusioned. I'm disappointed in you. Number four, he despairs with life and wants to die. We talked about that already. I want to get out of here. Uh, there's a Christian balance we need to have. We look for the coming of the Lord, but we're here to occupy until he comes. I love Southern gospel music. I love the harmony of it, but I don't like the themes for most of the songs. You know why? It doesn't teach me how to live life. It despairs of life by saying, come Lord, come Lord. So what kind of a testimony is that? Someone says, how you doing, Jerry? Oh, I can't wait for the coming of the Lord. All the problems with the, uh, the military and all the problems with ISIS and all the problems with the economy and all this and that. I can't stand it any longer. I want to get out of here. What kind of a testimony is that to the keeping and saving power of the Lord Jesus Christ? And so we find uh, parallels in our own lives. For the year that I spent in Vietnam, being rocketed twice a night, in the, the first six months, people dying around me. I could have taken the attitude, I can't stand it, I want to go, I can't even do my work, I hate it here, I want to go home. That was one of our favorite songs, I want to go home. We sang that every day. Sure we did, but we had life to live. We still had to eat, we had to bury the dead, we had to keep going, count the days, hope for the shows to come in and cheer us up when they came to the clubs, but still had to live. Wanted to go home, but didn't live our life with that attitude, oh, I have to go home all the time. That makes it worse for you. You live and, and enjoy as best you can and fulfill your mission, and then when you're released, hallelujah. It's great. So is life. We need to enjoy life. We need to be uh, showing that Jesus is able to keep us here and not just take us away from here. People around us are suffering also. They want to know that the Lord is not only the Lord of the soon return, but the Lord of the keeping until he returns. And so we, uh, the fifth lesson he has, he despairs 
for vindication with God. He's just, he wants to be vindicated. He's so unhappy. So that's what it was like for the first round. Second round is going to be the same way. We won't read every verse, but you'll get the flavor of it. Job has been talking about how horrible life is, how fleeting life is. And now the first friend opens up again, Eliphaz, chapter 15, beginning in verse 1. He's going to rebuke Job, as he has before, in the first 16 verses. And then he's going to talk about 16 calamities that befall the wicked. Now, a lot of these things they're saying are true, but they're totally inappropriate. Because they're saying, Job, you've sinned. They're trying to shock him, jolt him into confessing his sin to repent so he can be healed. But he's done nothing wrong. And so it's just a waste of time. So while these are true, they are not pertinent. And that's important for us in counseling, to be able to talk about what's pertinent. Somebody comes in and is despairing over a marriage. And I say, well, now, in Genesis chapter 1, God created the heavens and the earth, and then we find in the book of, um, of Exodus, with the, uh, and we go on, and what's that got to do with the problem of the marriage? We need to listen to what the Holy Spirit wants to say at that moment for that person. You go to a doctor, the doctor has the x-rays and puts the x-rays up on the screen for you to see. The doctor says, you know, when I was young, I wanted to go to medical school, and I wasn't sure which school to go to, and I had a scholarship here, but my desire was to go there. But then I had problems at home and this and that, but I did get through school, and then I was wondering, what kind of a doctor, what do the x-rays say, and what is your counsel? Get to the point. Same with us in counseling. Get to the point. What is the Holy Spirit saying for this person at this moment? And I had a counseling session last week, similar to this one. I'll bring all that stuff into this one. No, you won't. You're going to pray with a fresh, clean board and say, Holy Spirit, write on it today what this person needs or what this couple needs. So he's got the same old nonsense. Uh, you have sinned. Eliphaz the Temanite answers in chapter 15, should a wise man answer with empty knowledge and fill himself with the east wind? Don't insult the person you're counseling. You are an empty head and filled with hot air, is what they're saying. It's getting pretty nasty at this point. Should he reason with unprofitable talk or by speeches with which he can do no good? Yes, you cast off fear and restrain prayer before God. So you're not even afraid of God. You're not even praying to God. Imagine this, this technique in counseling. For your iniquity teaches your mouth, and you choose the tongue of the crafty. Your own mouth condemns you, and not I. Yes, your own lips testify against you. So I'm talking to this person in counseling and saying, you're just wicked. You're wicked. Verse 7, are you the first man who was born? Or were you made before the hills? Have you heard the counsel of God? Do you limit wisdom to yourself? Say to your counselee, oh, you think you're so smart? You think I, as the counselor, the pastor of this church, don't know as much as you? Who do you think you are? It's a great book on what not to do in counseling. One of the greatest books in the Bible about what not to do about not only counseling, but what not to do when you go through difficult times. My mother had the answer. I'm not sure she ever waited through all of Job to get it. She might have. But she said when suffering was going about, don't ask the Lord to take you out of it because that's not going to happen. But what is the lesson I am supposed to learn through this? What am I supposed to learn in this lesson? How many kids love school? How many kids love the 7th grade, 8th grade, ninth grade? Not too many. And what do the kids want to do? Get out of that grade as soon as possible, right? One of the people in our household was having trouble with some courses, and we were sitting down with the counselor, and the counselor said, now the courses you're flunking uh, need to be addressed, and said to this young fellow three times, go to the teacher and ask, what do I need to do to get my grade up to pass? At the end of the session, he said, uh, do you have any questions? He said, can I leave now? He didn't do that. He didn't go to the teachers to find out what he could do. 
and he had to repeat the year. He's doing that now. I think of suffering and life's problems at school. I want to go to the teacher and find out what do I need to do to pass this test. When I first got saved, they had a Christian song called Take Another Lap Around Mount Sinai Until You Learn Your Lesson Well. Go all the way around the mountain again to learn what God wants you to do. I don't want to repeat this grade. I don't want to repeat this lesson. Lord, what do I have to do to get out of this? Show me how to handle this suffering, how to praise you, how to worship you, and how to learn lessons so that not only I can come through this class. And Mother also taught me this. Pray for everybody else in the world who is going through the same situation. Get it beyond yourself. What can they do to learn the lesson? So we don't want to be insulting those we're counseling, and that's what he's doing here. Verse 14, the Eliphaz says, uh, What is man that he could be pure? And he who was born of a woman, that he could be righteous. If God puts no trust in his saints and the heavens are not pure in his sight, how much less man who is abominable and filthy, who drinks iniquity like water. Well, that's true. Man is a sinner. No question about that. There's nothing pure in heaven or on earth except the Lord and anything he touches. But when a guy is hurting and has not sinned, it doesn't help to say, you're drinking iniquity like water. Again, he's trying to shock him into repentance. I will tell you, hear me, what I have seen I will declare, what wise men have told, not hiding anything received from their fathers. The wicked man writhes with pain all his days, and the number of years is hidden from the oppressor. Dreadful sounds are in his ears. These are all the things that befall the wicked. It's true, but it has nothing to do with Job's case. These horrible sounds, verse 21. He doesn't believe that he will return from darkness. He's afraid of the darkness. When you're wicked, you're afraid of the sword that is waiting for you. Verse 23, hungry, looking for bread. Verse 24, you got trouble and anguish that makes you afraid, overpowers you. He stretches out his hand against God and acts defiantly against the Almighty, shaking your fist at God, running stubbornly against God with his strong embossed shield. You ever try to go against God? I never did read that, never see that play. I've always wanted to, or a musical about your arms are too short to box with God, is it? <laughs> ever try to get mad at God and take a swing at him? I never quite made a connection there, did you? Uh, it just leads to a powerful repentance afterwards. Verse 27, though he has covered his face with fatness, made his waist heavy with fat, he dwells in desolate cities. So they thought in those days that the sinful people were the fat people because they were just indulging their lustful pleasures on food and just getting fatter and fatter. Verse 29, you won't be rich, nor will your wealth continue. That's not true. You cannot say the wicked are not rich. There are some wicked who are very, very, very rich here on earth. And so we get, find that when you get argumentative, as they are here with Job, you tend to get a little bit off in your uh, being correct and right. He won't depart from darkness, verse 30. Let him not trust in futile things, deceiving himself, for utility will be his reward. So he offers nothing here that's of any help to Job. He's just making things worse for Job. So now Job has to answer in chapter 16. Job maintains his innocence in chapters 16 and 17. He talks in the first five verses about how he's disgusted with his friends. Job says in verse 2 of chapter 16, I have heard many such things. Miserable comforters are you all. <laughs> That's a well-known scripture. I think I've used that a time or two and probably been called that a time or two as well. Miserable comforters are you. Shall words of wind have an end? You're full of hot air. Or what provokes you that you answer? I also could speak as you do. If your soul were in my soul's place, I could heap up words against you and shake my head at you. Notice this. I could get angry at you if I were the one that was counseling. But here is a key point, verse 5. 
I would strengthen you with my mouth and the comfort of my lips would relieve your grief. That's what a counselor is supposed to do. <clears throat> You're supposed to strengthen the person and comfort the person. Why do you go to a doctor? Why do you go to the hospital? For abuse? When I was age 35, I did a smart thing. If I stood on a chair to put something on the top shelf, the chair had a U-shaped base. Uh, duh, guess what? The chair went over, but I fortunately broke the fall, didn't hit my face, used my wrist. A hundred pieces, call a Collie's comminuted fracture or a reverse silver spoon. Thousands of pieces. Went into the hospital. The doctor didn't say, you stupid fool, what are you doing here? He set about to try to provide relief and comfort as quickly and powerfully as possible. You wouldn't last long in the medical profession if you had that attitude of criticizing and chastising. You're there to help. You're there to relieve, to strengthen. Verse 6, though I speak, my grief is not relieved. If I remain silent, how am I eased? But now he has worn me out, talking about God. You have made desolate all my company. At this point, after the first round, Job is not paying so much attention to his friends. He knows they're against him, they're critical of him, and he is instead now focusing in on God. You're the one who could change this. You're the one who could do better than you're doing, and I'm unhappy with you. And again, we don't recommend that you say that to God. But better to tell God you're unhappy with him and enter into dialogue with him as best you can than to avoid him and turn away from him. He has worn me out. Verse 8, you've shriveled me up. It's a witness against me. My leanness rises up against me and bears witness to my face. Talking about God, he tears me in his wrath, hates me. He gnashes at me with his teeth. My adversary sharpens his gaze on me. They gape at me with their mouth. They strike me reproachfully. God has delivered me to the ungodly. See, he doesn't know about this contest between God and Satan, that God is going to show that he is faithful, that God's allowing him to go through this time of suffering to purify him, to refine him, and to prove to Satan and all the angels and the demon spirits, my people are faithful to me. But God is, in his mind, unfaithful. I was at ease, but he has shattered me. Verse 13, God's archers surround me. He pierces my heart, does not pity, pours out my gall on the ground, breaks me with wound upon wound. He runs at me like a warrior. Ever feel like that? It's natural. We know the sovereignty of God. We know that God could change this. He could stop this. He could turn things around. I've asked for forgiveness for whatever I've done and nothing comes to mind. I don't know that I have sinned to bring this about. Why are you doing this, God? And so he's suffering with this. And again, this book will not tell us fully why God does this. We don't fully know why we suffer. Well, we know from Genesis 3, it's because of original, the sin of Adam and on it goes. And sometimes our own sins bring about suffering. But many times we suffer in spite of the fact that we're doing right. I tithe, I pray, I go to church, I serve, and I still have problems. What's wrong? Is God a liar? Does God hate me? We don't know the answers to why we go through these things, but we have to trust him. He's going to work all things together for our good. Romans 8, 28 probably is the best antidote to all the claims of suffering and God's seeming lack of caring. All things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Verse 15, I have sewn sackcloth over my skin. My face is flushed with weeping. And of course, he is suffering, not to minimize that, but when you're suffering and those around you are not sensitive to that fact and they're not putting their arm around you to be understanding, but they start getting critical of you, what do you do? You begin to talk more about your suffering, and if you're not careful, you begin to exaggerate it. Look at these eyes. Look at the puffiness. Look at how thin I am, or look at how fat I am. Look at how miserable I am. I am suffering. 
Hello, I'm having problems out there. Knock, knock, knock on your empty head. Can't you see it? And God, can't you see what I'm going through? We go through that, don't we? And then if others around us get upset, we get more dramatic and we really pour it on. Verse 18, O earth, do not cover my blood. Let my cry have no resting place. He always talks about the few years that he has. Verse 21, oh, that one might plead for a man with God as a man pleads for his neighbor. He doesn't want to come to God and worship. He wants to stand before God and say, you are wrong. You have mistreated me. For when a few years are finished, I shall go the way of no return. We always pull that one out too. When people around us aren't listening, we think God's not listening. You're not going to have me around too much longer as your football, just to kick me around. So have your pleasure, have your fun, step on me, make fun of me. I won't be here much longer. In fact, I might even be going tonight. Or as who was it, uh, Sanford said, I think the big one's coming on here. And I think I'm getting close, right? And so we're just trying to get, trying to get somebody to say, I'm sorry. I, I'm, I'm here for you. I want to help you. What can I do? That's all he wants, but he won't get that. He won't get that from his friends. He wants it from God. God's quiet, and he thinks God's against him. Chapter 17, he's praying for relief. He's still communicating with God. When James says in his little epistle, the perseverance of Job, it does not mean that perseverance means that you never complain or you're never unhappy. It means you hang in there. That's the important thing. If he wasn't going to persevere, he would stop talking to God. But he perseveres. My spirit is broken. My days are extinguished. The grave is ready for me. Are not mockers with me? And does not my eye dwell on their provocation? Now put down a pledge for me with yourself. Who is he who shall shake hands with me? For you've hidden their heart from understanding. Therefore you will not exalt them. Talking about God in verse 6, he has made me a byword of the people. I become one in whose face men spit. We have to remember that Job was the wisest man in the East, probably the wealthiest man, had the greatest respect among people. And now it's just the opposite. And when you go through adversity, oh, people don't line up to respect you. They spit on me. My eye also has grown dim because of sorrow, and all my members are like shadows. Upright men are astonished at this. The innocent stirs himself upon, up against the hypocrite. But please, come back again, all of you, for I shall not find one wise man among you. So he's still well enough to be sarcastic. Hey, guys, don't go away. Uh, come on here, because I want to just see some more about how dumb you really are. Verse 11, my days are past. My purposes are broken off. That's another thing. When you're suffering, really suffering, in your mind, it's over. You're just getting ready for the grave. I don't care what age you are. You're not going to live much longer. You don't want to live much longer. My days are past, my purposes are broken off, even the thoughts of my heart. They change the night into day, the, night, the light is near. I wait for the grave as my house, make my bed in the darkness. I say to corruption, when the body corrupts, you're my father. To the worm, where you're going to have your body eaten, you're my mother and my sister. Where then is my hope? As for my hope, who can see it? Will they go down to the gates of Sheol? So what kind of hope am I going to have? You want to come down in the grave and see what I have down there? Shall we have rest together in the dust? So he's very, very unhappy. Friend number two, Bildad, comes back for his second go at our friend Job. No sympathy, no compassion. Now he's going to really pour it on. The wicked are punished. And Bildad does something we all do, and they all, all the friends do this. Sometimes we'll go right at somebody and say, you're a sinner. But sometimes we take a more indirect approach. I've done this and you've done this too. You don't want to quite go after the person, but you're talking to the person about people out there, and you describe how wicked they are out there, hoping this person next to me knows I'm really talking about you. Watch that. The wicked are this and the wicked are that. Parenthetically, he's saying, Job, you are that wicked person. 
So Bildad the Shuat says, verse 2, how long till you put an end to words? So you're all saying the same thing. You're full of hot air. And when you and I are in an argument, every word we say is pure gold and there's not enough time in the world to accommodate all of our words. But every word of the opponent is nothing but hot air. We can't wait for that person to be finished. So how long till you put an end to words? Gain understanding and effort we will speak. Why are we counted as beasts and regarded as stupid in your sight? You who tear yourself in anger, shall the earth be forsaken for you? Or shall the rock be removed from its place? Who are you? Is all of the world going to be rearranged to satisfy you, mister? The light of the wicked indeed goes out, and the flame of his fire does not shine. True, but what's that got to do with Job? And Bildad's not just talking about the wicked out there. He's saying, Job, you are the man. Verse 8, the wicked, he's cast into a net by his own feet. He walks into a snare. The net takes him by the heel. No, it is his own fault. And uh, terrors frighten him on every side. Verse 11, they drive him to his feet. His strength is starved. Destruction is ready at his side. Devours patches of skin. He goes on and talks about all these problems that come about on a wicked person. But again, it's irrelevant. And they're just getting personal at this point. They're really angry. I wonder by the time this is over if these guys ever really became friends again. Who knows? All I know is that God is listening to all of this. God's listening to all of Job's complaining. He listens to all of the accusations of the friends. And finally at the end, in his characteristic few words, God's going to deal with Job, then his friends. With Job, he's going to say, Mister, where were you when I created the heavens and the earth and begins to describe creation? Job then will say, oh my God. He'll get a revelation of God, and when he sees himself in the eyes of God, he sees himself truly as a sinner. He didn't sin to bring these matters on, but with his mouth, he's sinning right along. And then he turns to his friends, and he says, for all you guys said, if Job does not pray for you right now, I'm wiping all of you out. God cares nothing for what these guys have to say. He's ready to kill them because of their attitude towards Job and their treatment. So uh, now Job is going to defend himself against Bildad. Um, chapter 19, he's angry with his friends again. He's angry with God. Um, he thinks he's ignored by everyone. But yet he also is still certain that he's going to see God. He still has a faith relationship with God. Angry, but still trusting Job answered and said, verse chapter 19, How long will you torment my soul? Break me in pieces with words. These ten times you have reproached me. You're not ashamed that you have wronged me. And if indeed I have erred, my error remains with me. Verse 6, Know then that God has wronged me and has surrounded me with his net. And see, it's interesting. That's not cursing God. That's not cursing God. Cursing God, as I told you, is what happened to me with that Vietnam experience. I prayed not to go to Vietnam. But Washington didn't hear me, and Lyndon Johnson didn't hear me, and nobody else heard me, and I got on that plane, and I said, that's it. You won't hear my prayers, God? Forget about you. And I never talked to God again for 10 years. That's cursing God. And then 10 years later, my mother came over to my house, and she had talked about God, and I said, don't you ever mention the name of God in my house again. That's cursing God. But she kept praying for me, and six months later I came to the Lord, and I've gone through a lot of suffering, but never have turned from Him. That's where Job is. That's persevering. And that's what God's looking for. God's not expecting us to say, high five, hallelujah, I'm sick, I'm suffering, marriage is breaking up, finances are bottoming out, hallelujah, I'm happy. God says, what are you, nuts? But he says, I want you to still trust in me and still contact me. And if you have to say, I'm angry with you, then do it. Healthy relationships sometimes require some venting. We don't recommend that kids do that, but I'm exposed in a family setting to times when the kids will say to parents, I'm not happy. I'm not being treated this way or that, or somebody else is being preferred. 
First reaction is, oh, we should have a totally pristine and clear atmosphere where nothing negative ever is uttered to the parents. Whereupon they would say, Jerry, move from bachelorhood into reality. Well, yeah, that's how life is. And kids need to be able to vent and then also at times need to be able to say enough. And so God will allow some venting. But don't turn from God. Don't stop talking to Him. Verse 7, if I cry out concerning wrong, I'm not heard. God's not hearing me. I cry aloud, there's no justice. He's fenced up my way so that I cannot pass. He has set darkness in my path, stripped me of my glory, taken the crown from my head. He breaks me down on every side and I'm gone. My hope is uprooted like a tree. So that's a common theme we have. I can't get out of this situation. When you and I are in a difficult situation, we're looking for ways of escape. It's natural. Animals do it in the wild. We do it as well. How can I get out of this experience? We don't think, what can I learn from it? Should I stay here? I've had so many requests over the years. I want another job. Why do you want another job? I'm not happy where I am. I, want, I hate this job. And I said, I'm going to pray that God's going to have you right where he wants you to be. If he wants you out of that job, he'll take you out. If he wants you to stay there and learn your lessons and grow and mold and mature, then we're going to pray for you to stay there. I've done that a lot. I don't get so many calls from people <laughs> anymore about that. I'm not sure if they like that. But I'm good at praying about a job you don't like. The very first person we had, I mentioned, uh, in our church called up one day and he said, I'm unhappy on my job. I said, let's pray about that. We prayed and uh, he didn't want to stay in that job. Praise God, that prayer was answered so fast. He was fired that very day. And then he had no job at all for months and months and months. And I later talked to him. I said, you know, the only thing that's worse than your job is no job. <laughs> so you're not happy with your job, we'll pray afterwards, all right? But I still expect you to bring your tithes and offerings in even though you have no employment. All right. Um, let's look at verse 13. He has removed my brothers far from me, my acquaintances, my relatives have failed, close friends. I have nobody around me at all anymore. And you know that's partially true. If you're ever tired, you know, too many people around me, I can't stand the press of people around me. Pray for poverty, pray, pray for suffering, because I'll tell you, when you start to get poor and go through trouble, you'll be alone before you know it. And Proverbs talks about the reverse. You start getting lots of money and you're prosperous, your table will be filled with people. You'll be the most popular person around. Most people don't like to be around people who are going through suffering and adversity. That's why those who will stick with you, even in adversity, are truly, truly friends. Verse 21, have pity on me. That's what he wants. Have pity on me, have pity on me, O you my friends, for the hand of God has struck me. Why do you persecute me as God does and are not satisfied with my flesh? So he wants for them to sympathize with him. They don't want to sympathize because he's angry at God. Can't blame them, can't blame him. That's one of the difficult times. And that's why in counseling, there's that delicate art of walking alongside of someone, identifying with someone, metaphorically putting your hand around their shoulder, I know, I know, I know, and then gently saying, on the other hand, let's also look to God and look to what he may be doing, etc., and trying to get them, once they have sympathy and understanding, now get them to redirect their thinking beyond their own situation to God, to worship, and it's not easy. It's not easy and sometimes not accomplished that quickly. Uh, that's why counseling needs to be bathed in prayer before, during, and afterwards. It's not something that you do mechanically. So he says in verse 21, have pity on me. Oh, that my words were written, verse 23, that you would inscribe them in a book engraved on a rock with an iron pen. Verse 25, while he is so despairing, look at verse 25, for I know that my Redeemer lives. How incredibly wonderful is that? He sees God as his Redeemer in spite of all of this. That's not a man who's cursing God. I know that my Redeemer lives and he shall stand at last on the earth. How did he know that God would stand on the earth? How did he know that at the end of the tribulation, Jesus will return and stand on the Mount of Olives opposite Jerusalem 
and it's going to split in two. How did he know that Jesus came earlier and walked among us as God on the earth? Verse 26, and after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God. How did he know that? When my flesh is destroyed and I'm in the grave and corrupted, I will still have a body that will be able to see God. He is talking about the resurrection 4,000 years ago. Who gave him that knowledge? Only God. Whom, I, whom shall I see for myself? And my eyes shall behold. He's talking about God. After my eyes shall be, and my eyes shall behold, and not another, how my heart yearns within me. He wants to see God. If you should say, how shall we persecute him, since the root of the matter is found in me? Be afraid of the sword for yourselves, for wrath brings the punishment of the sword. So there's this wonderful break in the self-absorbed, critical attitude towards his friends and God to say, he's my redeemer, I'm going to see him. And that's a hope, a Christian hope, that we're going to see him in our flesh. That's not a hope that the world can say apart from Christ. But for those who are God's, we will see him in his flesh. Well, the third friend has to come back in here, Zophar, and he's picking up the same theme as Bildad did, talking about the wicked. They're trying to jolt him, shock him into repentance. That doesn't work too well. I was talking to someone before the service about atrial fibrillation and I asked the person about whether they had medication and what have you. I said, have you tried, have you talked, have they talked to you about shocking the heart back into sinus rhythm? It's one of the methods they use. I'm not saying it's good, bad, or indifferent, but it's one of the methods they'll do to put uh, some shock to that heart to get it into proper rhythm. These guys are trying to use a little shock treatment to get him back into repentance. They also say they do that for those in depression shock treatment. I guess it does well for the short-term memory, not so good for the long-term memory. You had problems before, you can't remember anything uh, that happened before yesterday, but uh, in any event, it's method that's being used. Um, and so let's shock them. Uh, verse 4, do you not know this of old, since man was placed on the earth? The triumphing of the wicked is short, the joy of the hypocrite is but for a moment, that's not true. A lot of wicked people I know have lived a lot of years, well into their 90s, even over 100. And I'm thinking, why would you do that, Lord? Giving them plenty of time, I guess, to turn to you and getting wealthier and wealthier and wealthier. Though his haughtiness mounts up to the heavens, his head reaches to the clouds, yet he will perish forever like his own refuse. That's true. Those who have seen him will say, where is he? He'll fly away like a dream and not be found. Yes, the wicked are going to be passing on. The eye that saw him will see him no more, nor will his place behold him. His children will seek his favor, and the hands will restore health. His bones are full of his youthful vigor, but it will lie down with him in the dust. Yeah, the wicked are going to die. Verse 12, though evil is sweet in his mouth, he hides it under his tongue. Verse 15, he swallows down riches, vomits them up again. God casts them out of his belly. So just talking about how the wicked are just not going to profit here on earth, and that's not always the case. Sometimes the earth is very good to the wicked apart from God, but it's only for a season, and certainly it does not prepare them for eternity with him. In chapter uh, 21 is our last chapter. Job talks about the fact you guys are wrong about the wicked because they in fact can prosper. Job answered, chapter 21, verse 1, Listen carefully to my speech. Verse 4, As for me, is my complaint against man? Look at me and be astonished. Put your hand over your mouth. Again, he wants sympathy. Look at how bad I look. Even when I remember, I'm terrified and trembling takes hold of my flesh. Why do the wicked live and become old? Yes, become mighty in power. They do become mighty in power in many cases. Their descendants are established with them in their sight, their offspring before their eyes. So he's arguing, 
You say the wicked don't last long and don't prosper here on earth. I'm telling you many times they do. Verse 9, as far as the wicked, their houses are safe from fear. Neither is the rod of God upon them. Their bull breeds without failure. Their cow calves without miscarriage. They send forth their little ones like a flock and their children dance. They sing to the tambourine and harp. They spend their days in wealth and in a moment go down to the grave. They don't die agonizing deaths always. Sometimes the wicked just close their eyes and fall asleep. Yet they say, they say to God, depart from us. We don't desire the knowledge of your ways. So they want nothing to do with God, and yet their life on earth is not that bad. Verse 17, how often is the lamp of the wicked put out? How often does their destruction come upon them? The sorrows God distributes in his anger. They're like straw before the wind. They say God lays up one's iniquity for his children. Let him recompense him. So don't tell me the wicked have it tough down here. Sometimes they have a good life here. Verse 22, can anyone teach God knowledge since he judges those on high? One dies in his full strength, being wholly at ease and secure. His pails are full of milk. The marrow of his bones is moist. Another man dies in the bitterness of his soul, never having eaten with pleasure. They lie down alike in the dust and worms over them. That's, that's life. Some have it easy, some have it hard. Look, I know your thoughts and the schemes with which you would, be, would wrong me. For you say, where is the house of the prince and where is the tent, the dwelling place of the wicked? Have you not asked those who travel the road? No, one's ask anybody. The wicked are reserved for the day of doom. They shall be brought out on the day of wrath. Who condemns his way to his face and who repays him for what he's done? So there's going to come a time of payment for the wicked. They will go before the judgment seat. They will have their day of doom. They'll be brought out of the grave, verse 32, a vigil kept over the tomb. The clods of the valley shall be sweet to him. But there's going to be an accounting. So you, you comfort me with empty words, falsehoods that remain in your answers. So you guys are absolutely worthless is what he's saying. So we've got some interesting lessons here. Chapter 15, where Eliphaz is opening up against him, presumes that Job is a sinner. We must not, in counseling, presume another sin. And don't try to jolt that person, shock treatment that person into repentance. You'd better repent or it's going to happen to you, thus and such and whatever. Repentance must be natural in their own hearts. Job will repent of his sins when he sees and hears God. Chapter 16 and 17, as Job maintains his innocence, when all seems hopeless, as it does for Job, keep your eyes on Jesus. Just keep looking to Jesus. Um, chapter 18, Bildad goes after Job about the wicked. He uses right words, but he's got the wrong heart, the wrong application. Chapter 19, Job reacts in anger. When emotions go up and down and up and down again, just look to Jesus. Zophar comes in after Job again, says to repent. Don't use God's truths in an angry and judgmental manner the way he's doing here. And finally, Job, who says the wicked prosper. The wicked personally seem to be blessed here, but their end is not good. Psalm 73 talks about that. Um, I thought it wouldn't pay to serve God. I thought the wicked did better than the righteous. It doesn't pay to serve God. And then I went into the sanctuary and I saw their end. And they're on a slippery slope before eternity. Unless they repent, they'll be separated from God eternally. Back to counseling. One quick word on counseling. Sometimes a lot of words are not helpful. We see that. We got a lot of words here from the friends. Many years ago, the Lord gave me an assignment that I absolutely despised. I knew it was God, and he said, I want you to hire this man and prepare this man for the pastoral ministry. I knew the man well, and I said, God, it's never going to work. Never going to work. He's not pastoral material. God said, do it. Went down to Florida on vacation with my mother, mother and father. We were in our condominium, and I was fussing and fuming in the little green room, which was called green because the color was green. And it was night, around 9 o'clock at night, and I was angry at God. 
And mother was there with me, and I said, Mom, this is wrong. This person's never going to make it. I, I can't believe I'm going to spend all my time doing this. It's a worthless effort. And I was fussing and fuming. I was angry at God. Mother said nothing. This went on for 45 minutes. And I was getting just like Job. Why, why, why would you do this to me? I've got enough to do. This is the biggest waste of time. This guy is never going to make it. On and on. And I kept complaining and complaining for 45 minutes. The room was dark. All the lights were out. I knew my mother was still there. I just listened and listened and listened. And she was a gifted counselor. Never met the likes of her. Gifted counselor. She never opened her mouth for 45 minutes. Then suddenly over from the couch, her little voice began to open up. Jesus, name above all names. And I began to cringe inside. She hasn't heard a word I've said. Beautiful Savior, glorious Lord. I finally said, I can't let her do this alone. And I said, Emmanuel, God is with us. I finished that refrain. It lifted, and I was fine. And I said, thy will be done. I came back to Albany. I hired him. It wasn't as bad as I thought. It was 10 times worse than I ever thought. And I spent three hours every day undoing what he had done wrong in the five hours every day. But I hung in there, and I hung in there for a year, and it was horrible. Finally, he left. And I said, God, what was that all about? I told you it wouldn't work out, as if God needed my information. He said, since birth since he could f first realize what he wanted to do, he wanted to pastor. He's been good, he has tried, he has loved me, and I wanted him to get a first-hand experience of what pastoring is like. Now he knows he is not pastoral material. Now he is ready to hear from me as to what I have for him. And the inconvenience you went through is small compared to changing the direction of his life and the purpose I have for him. He went on to become very, very successful, working closely with his wife. He is still involved with this ministry. And of all the people I've worked with over the years, he is the one who comes back the most often with the most expression. And he has this little saying, hey, pastor, you know what? And I say, yes, blank, I love you. And he is absolutely uh, in his dream job. He never looked back. So the counseling, though, was the best counseling I ever received. She never gave me a word, just pointed me to Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful for the book of Job. Thank you, Lord, that you're teaching us maybe not why we suffer, but how to go through suffering. And if we have to shorthand it, let's just say, Jesus, name above all names, beautiful Savior, glorious Lord, Emmanuel, God is with us. Lord Jesus, come into our hearts. Help us to keep our eyes upon you. We don't always know why we suffer, but we know that you love us, and that all things are working together for good. We're trusting you, Lord. We're going to worship you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.